It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Changemakers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Most people experience a traumatic event at some point in their lives. While the symptoms of trauma usually improve over time, some people may experience lingering effects that interfere with their day-to-day lives. Joining us to talk about trauma and its impact is Dr. Stephanie Covington, a pioneer in the fields of addiction, trauma, and recovery. Dr. Covington is a clinician, author, and organizational consultant who has written many articles and books, including the best-selling recovery book, A Woman's Way Through the Twelve Steps. Her new book is Hidden Healers, The Unexpected Ways Women in Prison Help Each Other Survive. Welcome, Dr. Covington. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for the invitation. Doctor, I'm excited about this conversation. A a few weeks ago, I attended a workshop about PTSD, and it was geared toward Mm -hmm. first responders, but I learned so much that night. So I'm, I'm happy that you're here because I think this is a topic that impacts us all. So for the sake of this conversation, how is trauma defined? Well, I'm going to give you sort of a generic definition. It's when there's an event that happens in someone's life and it overwhelms them so that they no longer have the capacity to cope, either physically or psychologically. So it's it's this overwhelming event. And so we know just from how you started the our conversation, that this happens to people in many, many different ways. This is not an uncommon experience. So, Doctor, what is actually happening in the brain and the body when we experience those events? You know, what happens is that when the first thing that happens when there's a traumatic event is what we call the initial response, which is the fight, flight, freeze response. And this is just an automatic response that happens in the body. And one of the best ways to explain this is if you've ever driven on a country road and a deer runs in front of your car, at the moment of greatest danger, it freezes and stops. And that's that same mechanism that can happen in our bodies. So, and then our brain goes on high alert. And when someone hasn't had an opportunity to manage the trauma and learn how to manage the trauma, they can get stuck in this, if you will. So the body stays hyper aroused, the brain is aroused, and this is where we get post-traumatic stress disorder, which is one of the options, one of the option, one of the things that can happen when there's been a traumatic experience. But there's really a whole range of, of things that can happen. Doctor, why does a particular event impact one person differently from another? So, for example, when I started doing this work in a period of five months, my mother died, my 23-year marriage ended, my sister died, and then my oldest son left for college. So any one of those things could impact a person in, in a very detrimental way. I went through all of those in a short period of time. Why was I able to move through that and turn it into the work I do now to turn it into something positive when it may have kept another person stuck in a victim mentality. You know, what makes each of us different in the way we handle these things? Well, number one, you had an incredible amount of loss in a short period of time. I mean, just listening to that, that that's amazing. But we each have a different level of resilience and it has to do with some ways what we're born with constitutionally, the resources that are around us, there are many things that go into making up our individual differences. And we actually learned a lot about individual differences when you look at 9-11 in New York City, where there were millions of people experiencing a catastrophic event. 
And some people had what we call an acute traumatic response. They were really upset, distressed for 30 to 60 days, but their lives came back to normal. And there are other people who decades later are still struggling. And this just has to do with some of our individual constitution, as I said, or and, and also the resources around us for support. That's one of the major things, really, when we look at the amount of trauma in our society, is what are the resources in that person's community that can help them bridge back from, from the event? And that makes a huge difference. So I'm going to make a guess that in that period of time when you were experiencing so much loss, you also had a support system around you. And I think the sad thing is when someone's struggling and going through a challenge like that, we tend to think we're weak. And and it's really, right. I think, the opposite to be able to get through something like that. You're not weak at all. You're incredibly strong. Absolutely. Absolutely. And these these kinds of events really pull on our personal strengths. That's what they're doing. They're They're saying to us, okay, I mean, I think this is one of the things that often – certainly the way I grew up and many people grown up, you think that um, bad things happen to bad people, that if you live a good life, nothing bad will happen, right? Well, that's ridiculous. Life is filled with all kinds of unexpected events that create suffering. And we need to embrace that as part of life and use those events to, to um, learn from, grow from, um, Actually, Helen Keller has a wonderful quote where she says, talks about the amount of suffering that's in the world, but there's also the overcoming of it. So both things are true. When we think about trauma, we always think about something that happened to us, you know, um, mm -hmm. death, violence, sexual assault. But in that presentation, he spoke about something that I wasn't familiar with. It's called vicarious trauma. And so mm -hmm. he is a retired prosecutor. And he shared a story about when he was a young prosecutor and his first case was a little girl who was a sexual assault victim. And he said as he sat in the courtroom and this little girl walked in with her hair and pigtails and a dress, and then he listened to her share the story of all these horrific things that happened to her, he said he started to feel very strange in his body. He was having all of mm -hmm. these sensations, but he didn't understand what they were. He said, and then over the years, it was case after case, the same type of thing, and he said eventually he ended up in a therapist's office. So right. he was just sharing something that it, it doesn't always have to happen to us. It can be the residue no. of exposure to something that we experience on a repeated basis. Yes, this vicarious trauma or sometimes it's called secondary post-traumatic stress disorder happens to first responders. Just like the other evening when you were listening to this presentation, it happens for therapists. It happens for people who work in correctional settings. There are a whole variety of different um, ways that, that someone can experience this. So it's important to, to understand that if you're in, well, you do radio, <laughs> radio talk, there can be times that someone may be sharing something on one of, in one of your segments that could be distressing to you. It can come in a whole variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. And so we all need to really have a, a toolbox of coping skills, if you will, for when these things occur, whether it's direct or indirect. Do you think it affects a person more if they're an, an empath or if they have more compassion than someone else may? Well, I think it actually impacts both. I think the person who's more empathic is going to be more conscious and aware of it. Some people are walled off, if you will. Um, in which they try not to be impacted by what's happening around them. It doesn't mean it's not impacting them. It's just they've created a wall or a blockage so that they don't um, experience it as acutely or directly, but it's still impacting their body. You mentioned secondary PTSD. What are the different types of PTSD? Well, there's regular, there's PTSD. The post-traumatic stress disorder is one of the responses that people have to trauma. And this is where you uh, have difficulty sleeping, you have intrusive thoughts, there are a variety of things going on, and you have basically the same symptoms with secondary PTSD. People are having uh, bad dreams, 
They find they're thinking about things that they don't want to think about. Um, there's a level of agitation. So it's the same symptoms. It's just it's coming because of what you've heard happen to someone else or what you've seen. Um, sometimes I wonder about the amount of things that are distressing that are on the news and, you know, the pictures of things that have happened. And that a lot of that can impact people also. If someone is experiencing some of the things that you just described, what is the best way to begin the healing journey? Well, the first thing that needs to happen is having some coping skills. And I'm going to share a couple of things with you, and they're going to seem very simplistic, but in fact, they can be really, really helpful. The important thing with trauma, I want to first talk about one other thing quickly, is we talk about triggers or activators. <clears throat> and that's when something in the environment, it can be a sight, a sound, a smell, reminds us of the traumatic event. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we're pushed back in time and flooded by the feelings that belong in the past. So a lot of the coping skills that we teach people have to do with how to stay in the here and now, how to stay in this moment in time. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one is a breathing exercise. And so we use breath a lot to help people what we call ground or self-soothe or calm themselves. And the breathing exercise is breathing in like you're smelling a rose and breathing out like you're blowing out a candle. So it's doing breathing, doing this breath exercise five, six, seven times. Another exercise is called the five senses activity. And this is where you look around and you name to yourself everything you can see in the room. You name to yourself now four things you can touch. So it's five things you can see, four things you can touch, uh, three things you can smell, uh, and then think about taste. So you go through your senses in the room where you are to get yourself into the here and now. And it's what we call grounding, staying, staying in place, if you will. So we teach people who are trauma survivors way to manage a trigger or an activator. And you can imagine how distressing it would be for you to have an experience, let's say 10 years ago, and now something happens and you're flooded by the feelings belong to an event 10 years ago. You want to be able to be in the here and now where you feel safe. And that can happen so easily because I shared what I had gone through. And sometimes I'm walking up a supermarket aisle and I'll see a box mm -hmm. of cereal I used to buy for my children when they were little or right. my husband. And I will start to cry in the store. You yeah. get this wave of emotion. And so yeah. I can see how these coping mechanisms will snap you back into the present moment. But boy, it comes over you before you even realize it. Right. It's not, a, it's not a conscious thing. It happens in the unconscious mind. And so you can imagine what it's like for people that have never understood anything about trauma, talked about trauma. They don't know what's happened to them. So over the years, I've had people say to me, well, I just thought I was crazy. I've been hiding this all my life. I didn't even know there was a, such a thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. Worked with, uh, I do a lot of work in, the, in prison settings. I had a a man say to me, I just thought trauma was a hospital. I didn't know it was a word you could use with my childhood. So it's really important that we educate people about this so they have a better understanding of what, what's happened to them in the past and what's happening to them in the present. Because that unresolved trauma, it will manifest in ways that, like you said, you don't expect. Right. It can manifest in a whole variety of ways. I mean, we, we've talked about post-traumatic stress disorder. It can manifest as depression, as isolation, as substance use disorder, as a suicide attempt, uh, rage. By, it manifests itself in many, many different ways. So you just said that you do a lot of work in prisons. Do you mm -hmm. believe that people, that there are some people that are in prison because of unresolved trauma? You know, the saying, hurt people, hurt people. Like if we had more interventions, better interventions, do you think we would see a reduction in crime? 
I do think so. I mean, there's a certain percentage of people in our men and men's and women's prisons that probably need to be there because we don't know how to help them. But it's a very small percentage. A large percentage of people who are there uh, could certainly be in our communities, supervised in our communities. And we find people are able to make changes in their lives, particularly when they have a deeper understanding of themselves. But if we were helping, particularly in our schools and with children, dealing with trauma and having resources as to how to um, how for them to be able to grow in a healthy way, I do think we would have less crime and we certainly would have fewer people in our carceral settings. Well, your new book talks about the unexpected ways that women in prison help each other. Can you tell us a little bit more about this book and, and what are you learning? Well, one of the things I wanted to do, I, I interviewed 22 formerly incarcerated women and I wanted just to have a picture of what happens in a woman's life from the time she gets on the van to go to prison, her journey in prison, and then coming out. Because this population of people in our society has, that women are invisible. We know more about men in prison, usually, than we know about women. So I wanted to shine light on the invisibility. And also to help people understand, I mean, Orange is the New Black gave everybody an image of prison. And while the book, I think, is accurate, the show became more and more sensationalized, more sex, more violence. But there's an untold piece, and that is how women survive in there is how they help each other. And there are simple things very often, but very profound things. And I think people don't think about women in prison helping each other. And we, those of us living in our communities can learn a lot from how the women do this. Even though they have few resources, they're often giving to each other. Would you share maybe one or two ways that they do help one another? Yes, I think one of the stories is, is about a woman who was diagnosed with cancer. She had cancer treatment. She came back to the prison the medical staff said, you need to be on a liquid diet. So she comes into the prison, says, I need to be on a liquid diet. The prison says, we can't deal with that. We don't do customize people's diets. You'll just have to drink water. The women around her found a way to create a liquid diet for her, and they made sure she had the nutrition she needed. And when her children came to visit, they made sure she was showered, her hair was shampooed, she had makeup on, so she wouldn't look too sick for her children. And that's one example of what women do for each other. Mm-hmm. So there's this kind of caretaking. I think another example is the story. I was interviewing a woman, and she's out, right? she has been in prison maybe eight years. And she said to me, you know, Stephanie, the best Christmas I ever spent was in prison. And I must say, Joan, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I said, really? She said, yes. She said, you know, there was the Christmas where in the housing unit we all drew names, and we had to figure out how we could make or create some kind of gift for each other, simple gift. On Christmas Day, a mural was hung up that two women had drawn a mural of children playing in the snow. We sang karaoke. We did our gift exchange. We had saved Dorito bags, turned them inside out because they're silver on the inside, and used that to create wrapping paper. She said it was the most thoughtful, loving Christmas. She said, now I'm out. I'm with my family. It's wonderful. But she said, we run into the store and we buy something quickly. Mm -hmm. She Mm -hmm. said, the most meaningful Christmas was the one I spent in prison. Why do you think these women transformed to become hidden healers? You know, I think they're in this very challenging environment, and I think there's this real sense of seeing, understanding their own pain and sensing another woman's pain and wanting to do something different and Mm -hmm. provide something that's different to help them survive. The majority of these women who come out of prison go into the helping professions. It's very, very interesting to me, you know. In the book, I also talk about the experience that sort of started me on this path, where decades ago, I 
was able to literally talk my way into a minimum security facility in North Carolina. And when I was in there, the women took care of me. These women didn't know me, but they're the ones that said to me, did they give you a roll of toilet paper? No. Well, you have to go get some from the officer. I said, well, isn't there any in the bathroom? They said, oh, no, it's rationed. We get one roll every two weeks. They said, um, did they give you soap? I said, yes. They said, we use that to wash our sneakers. It'll take the skin off your hands and your face. I was in a cafeteria line. I went to reach for an apple. They said, oh, no, 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 the fresh fruits for the staff. It was the women who are helping me navigate that system. It's that little seed of kindness, doctor, that little seed of light that can be used to transform one of these women's lives. Absolutely. And when they're provided programming and have resources, you know, when they come out, what do women need? They need housing. They need a job. They need education skills. They need to reunite with their children. Some of them need substance use disorder treatment. Um, There's a whole variety of things that are needed. And while they're on the inside, we can be providing programs that make a difference. And this is why on the inside, I provide a lot of programs focusing on addictive disorders and on trauma, both for the men and the women. Right, because the trauma, then unresolved trauma, can lead to the addictive disorders. And then that leads me to another one of your books, which is The 12 Steps for Trauma. How does implementing the 12-step program help heal trauma? Well, um, the the 12-step program, the the book that I wrote, A Woman's Way Through the 12 Steps, is really focused on any kind of addictive disorder. But in that book, I also talk about trauma because of the connection between the two. We know that for many women who've had a traumatic experience in their life, they often turn to alcohol or other drugs as a way to deal with the symptoms, as a way to comfort themselves, as a way to not feel, as a way to numb. So there's that connection. We also have, have women who, are, think about it, women are much more vulnerable to harm if they're under the influence. So that's another way that, uh, that there's a connection. So when I'm helping women think about how to use the 12 steps. And in that book also, I interviewed a diverse group of women around the country to get their words about what the steps meant to them. I've also talked about trauma because so many women have gone to meetings in their lives in terms of recovery from addiction, and no one's ever talked about trauma. So I want to make sure that they understand the, the connection between the two. Doctor, where can our listeners go to get more information about you and your work? Um, I have a website. It's www.stephaniecovington.com. And on the website, you'll find uh, books and articles and for people who like research and a whole variety of different resources. Uh, We also do a lot of training of professionals. So there's a lot of information uh, on the website. And once again, that site is stephaniecovington.com. Doctor, in our final moments, what is the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? I'd like to suggest to the listeners that I think when we look at women's lives, we have to look at both sides of this. We have to acknowledge the amount of abuse and trauma that women have in their lives. Interpersonal violence, women are far greater risk than men. So we need to acknowledge that. And on the other side, we need to acknowledge the incredible amount of help and healing that we see women not only for themselves, but that they share with others. And to also think about our prison system and take ownership of it and not have women be so invisible and lost to us. Dr. Covington, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read our digital articles, and be sure to subscribe to our mailing list. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. 
Thanks for tuning in. 